Hello and welcome to the lecture on communications and documentation as part of the EMT training program at Flathead Valley Community College. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, a, a student in this program will have an understanding of therapeutic communication, the means to effectively communicate with specialty patients such as children, elderly, hearing and visually impaired patients, methods and procedures for effective communication, components of effective written reports, types of written reports, and ways to correct errors found within written reports. You will also be competent with documentation of refusal of care, special reporting, use of medical terminology, communication systems and equipment, regulations and protocols governing radio communications, and communication with medical control in hospitals. We've talked about the National EMS Education Standard competencies, which are very broad-based. And in this section on preparatory for EMTs, you will apply fundamental knowledge of the emergency medical services system, the safety and well-being of the EMT, medical, legal, and ethical issues in the provision of care. With therapeutic communication, you will study and understand the principles of communicating with patients in a manner that achieves a positive relationship. We'll talk about interviewing techniques, adjusting communication strategies for age, stage of development, and patients with special needs, as well as differing cultures. We'll talk about verbal diffusing strategies and family presence issues. We'll talk about EMS system communication and that communication is needed to enable you to call for additional resources to transfer care of your patient to someone else, to interact within the pre-hospital and definitive care team structure. And we'll talk about the EMS communication system, communicating with other healthcare professionals, and team communications and dynamics. Regarding documentation, you'll learn to record patient findings, and we'll talk about the principles of medical documentation and report writing. And regarding medical terminology, you will use foundational anatomic and medical terms and abbreviations in written and oral communication with colleagues and other healthcare professionals. Basically, when we're talking about communication, it is the transmission of information to another person. It doesn't matter whether it's verbal or through nonverbal techniques like body language. Verbal communication skills are very important to the EMT. They will enable you to gather information from your patient, your family members, and bystanders. It will make it possible for you to coordinate all the responders who are often present at the scene, and it is an integral part of transferring the patient's care to nurses and physicians at the hospital. Documentation is the written part of the patient's permanent medical record. It demonstrates that appropriate care was delivered. It communicates the patient's story to others who may participate in the patient's future care. Your ability to adequately report and accurately record information about your patient ensures the continuity of patient care. Complete patient records guarantee proper transfer of responsibility. They comply with the requirements of health departments and law enforcement agencies, and it fulfills your organization's administrative needs. Radio and telephone communication links you to other members of your team, EMS, fire, and law enforcement. You must know what your system can and cannot do, and you also need to know how to use the system efficiently and effectively. The next topic we're going to talk about is therapeutic communication. And therapeutic communication uses various communication techniques and strategies. It utilizes both nonverbal and verbal techniques, and it encourages patients to express their feelings and achieves a positive relationship with the patient. The Shannon Weaver communication model was developed to assist in the mathematical theory of communication for Bell Telephone Labs in the late 1940s. The model remains a valuable tool in understanding human communications. Basically what happens in this model is the sender takes a thought, they encode it into a message, they send the message to the receiver, the receiver then decodes the message and sends feedback to the sender. This is a communications loop. Some of the factors that will um, need to be considered and some strategies to help with communications techniques 
um, regard age, culture, and personal experience. So there are more than just those three, but age, body language, clothing, culture, educational background, environment, eye contact, facial expression, gender, posture, voice, tempo, speed, and volume. These are some of the things you as a care provider will need to consider. With age, culture, and personal experience, this really shapes how a person communicates. Body language and eye contact are greatly affected by culture. In some cultures, direct eye contact is considered impolite, and in other cultures, it is impolite to look away or not have direct eye contact while speaking. Tone, pace, and volume of the language is an important factor. It tells us about the mood of the person communicating, and it provides insight into the perceived importance of the message. Ethnocentrism is something we have to think about, and you need to consider your own cultural values more important than those of others. That's what ethnocentrism is, is where we consider our own cultural values more important than those of others. People tend to translate messages they receive using your own worldview. Another term you need to know is cultural imposition, and that is forcing your values onto others. We may, as healthcare providers, either subconsciously or consciously force our own cultural values onto our patients because we believe our values are better. As we move into nonverbal communication, body language gives more information than words alone. Body language um, is just that thing that our bodies do as we communicate. We can pay attention to body language, both ours and our patients, and those physical cues help you and your patient to truly understand the message being sent. Some of the things that we look at are facial expressions, eye contact, other physical cues. Physical factors, um, noise, anything that dampens or obscures the true meaning of the message can be a factor, as well as proxemics, which is the study of space and how distance between people affects communication. As a person gets closer, a greater and greater sense of trust must be established, and when you finally enter someone's intimate space, there must be a high sense of trust. So we have to be aware of personal space, and we have to be aware of when we invade that personal space and that our patients are going to trust us when we do that to do the right thing. When we're talking about verbal communications, one of the most fundamental functions of an EMT is that we ask our patients questions. We like to use open-ended questions if we can because that requires some level of detail in the patient's response. We use this whenever it's possible. For example, we might ask a patient, what seems to be bothering you today? or what did you call EMS for today? Closed-ended questions can be answered in very short responses. Types of questions would, would be something the patient can answer yes or no to. We do that if the patient maybe physically can't give us long answers because of their condition. For example, we might say, are you having trouble breathing? And they can either say yes or nod their head. There are many powerful communications tools that you can use while trying to obtain information from your patients. These are facilitation, silence, reflection, empathy, clarification, confrontation, interpretation, explanation, and summary. With facilitation, we are encouraging the patients to talk more or provide more information, and we can do this by those open-ended questions. Silence is us remaining silent while the patient is telling us their story. With reflection, we restate a patient statement that we receive to confirm our understanding of what they're saying. So you're telling me you're having chest pain with your shortness of breath or your difficulty breathing. Empathy, being sensitive to the patient's own feelings and thoughts. Clarification, asking the patient to explain what he or she meant by their answer. Confrontation. For patients who are in denial 
or in a mental state of shock, we can use this to make them focus on urgent and life critical issues so that we can deal with those issues. Interpretation is where you actually sum up your patient's complaint. Explanation, we provide factual information to support the conversation. And summary is providing the patient with an overview of our conversation and the steps we will be taking to help them. When you interview a patient, consider the careful use of touch to show caring and compassion. Touch is a very powerful tool and you must use it consciously and sparingly. You should avoid touching the patient's torso, chest, or face simply as a means of communication because these are considered to be intimate space areas and intimate areas. And so if we do this, we need to be sure that we are clear on what we need to do and we ask our patient's consent to perform these assessments. When interviewing a patient, consider the careful use of touch to show caring and compassion. Some of the interview techniques that we should avoid, providing a false assurance or reassurance. If the patient asks you, am I going to die, don't answer them with not today or not in my ambulance. We have no way of necessarily knowing that. Giving unsolicited advice. Asking leading or biased questions. Talking too much. Interrupting the patient as they're answering questions using why in their questioning, using authoritative language, or speaking in a professional jargon. With hostile patients, they can become hostile toward us. We need to diffuse these situations, um, especially if they are escalating, by staying very calm. We need to be open and honest in our conversation with our patients, and we always consider the safety of the scene and should call for assistance when necessary. Never should an EMT threaten a patient. When family members and bystanders are present, present, they may be valuable during the interview. Be sure to allow the patient to answer if they are able and want to, even if well-meaning family members attempt to answer for them. It's okay to tell the bystander, thank you, could you please let the patient answer the question. You may need to decide if having family and friends nearby will make the patient more or less anxious. Some of the golden rules to help calm and reassure a patient. Make and keep eye contact at all times. Provide your name and use the patient's proper name. We don't mean a nickname. We want to call our patients, for example, Mr. Jones or Mrs. Smith. Now they may ask you to call them by their first name or a nickname and if they do so, that's okay. Avoid slang names like hun, sweetie, bud, things like that. Those are not appropriate to use in talking with our patients. Be truthful with your patient. You need to use the language the patient can understand. Most patients don't know a lot about medical terms and medical terminology. Stay away from those. Be careful what you say about the patient to others. This can violate HIPAA. Be aware of your own body language. You need to speak slowly clearly and distinctly. If a patient is hearing impaired, face them so they can read your lips. Something else to remember is don't assume that a patient who is elderly is hearing impaired. Allow the patient time to answer or respond to your question and act and speak in a calm, confident manner. One of the issues we deal with is communicating with older patients. The first thing we need to do is always identify ourselves. You can come up with a phrase, Hi, I'm Chris, I'm a paramedic or an EMT with the ambulance. Hi, I'm Chris, I'm an EMT with Evergreen Fire. You know, you can give your agency identifiers, whatever you would like to do, but give your name and your level of certification to your patient. Be aware of how you present yourself. Look directly at your patient and speak slowly and distinctly and not unnecessarily loud. Explain what you are going to do before you do it. Listen to the answers your patient gives you. Show your patient respect. Do not talk about the patient in front of him or her, and you need to be patient, especially with older patients. Oftentimes, older patients do not feel much pain. They may not be fully aware of important changes in their body system, and therefore, you must be especially vigilant for objective changes in your patient's status. 
When possible, you should give the patient time to pack a few personal items before leaving for the hospital. Locate hearing aids, glasses, and dentures before departure so they can take these necessary devices with them. Another end of the spectrum in communications is communicating with children, and this is different because they are not little adults. Emergency situations frighten anyone, and this fear is most obvious and severe with kids. They may be frightened by your ambulance, your uniform, the crowd of people who may be gathered around them. Those are all things that can frighten a child. If at all possible, let the child keep a favorite toy, doll, or blanket with them. And if possible, have a family member or friend very close by. And if practical, you can let the parent or guardian hold the child during your evaluation and treatment. Be honest. Children know when adults lie to them. They can easily see through lies or deception. If something's going to hurt, say so. Tell them it will hurt, but only for a minute or a few seconds. Respect that a child is modest. Speak in a professional but friendly way. Maintain eye contact with the child. Position yourself on their level. Do not ever tower over a child. These are all things that are important in dealing with children. Hearing impaired patients give us a special challenge. Most people with hearing impairments have normal intelligence and are not embarrassed by their disability. You should position yourself so that the patient can see your lips. Many times they can read lips or if their hearing is not completely gone, the augmentation of lip reading and seeing what you're saying helps them understand what you're saying. If patients have hearing aids, be careful that they are not lost during an accident or fall. They may be forgotten if the patient is confused. Ask the family if the patient uses hearing aids. Some steps to take to effectively communicate with patients who may be hearing impaired. Have paper and pen available. Again, if the patient can read lips, face them and speak slowly and distinctly. Never shout or raise your voice. Listen carefully, ask short questions, and give short answers. Learn some simple phrases in sign language. Useful to know signs for sick, hurt, and help. The other type of patient we may have to deal with is a patient who is visually impaired. The first thing we should do is ask the patient if he or she can see at all. Visually impaired patients are not necessarily completely blind. Expect your patient to have normal intelligence. Just because they are visually or hearing impaired does not decrease their intelligence. Explain everything you are doing as you are performing your actions. Stay in physical contact with the patient as you begin your care. That sense of touch is very important. If the patient can walk to the ambulance, place his or her hand on your arm. Transport any mobility aids, such as a cane, with the patient to the hospital. Sometimes your patient may have a guide dog. These are easily identified by a special harness. If possible, the dog should go with your patient. It alleviates stress for both the patient and their guide dog. Otherwise, you may need to arrange for care of the dog. A conscious patient can tell you about the dog and give care instructions to, to you to arrange for care. As we work through EMS, we find that sometimes we have to communicate with non-English speaking patients. You have to find a way to get medical history even though the patient does not speak English. This is a step we cannot skip. Find out if the patient knows a few words or phrases in English. You need to use short, simple questions, point to body parts. You can have a family member or friend interpret and consider learning some common phrases in another language that is used in your area. There are also pocket cards you can purchase that show the pronunciation of terms. Um, in the Flathead Valley community, we have a large population of Ukrainian and Russian speaking individuals, um, also Asian speaking or Chinese, Japanese, um, Korean, that type of language. So these are something that we see more frequently in our area. In our communication with other healthcare professionals, our reporting responsibilities, we have to remember, do not end when we arrive at the hospital. Effective communication between EMS providers and other healthcare professionals in the receiving facility is essential for sufficient, effective, appropriate patient care. You must give an oral report to a hospital staff member who is at least trained to your level. 
Oral report components include opening information. You need to tell them the patient's name, their chief complaint, and what their illness is. Give detailed information that you didn't provide during your radio report and give any important history that was not already provided. Your patient's response to treatment given in route is important. Um, talk about their vital signs and give any other information such as details gathered during transport and patient medications you brought with you. As we move into written communications and documentation, the common term for our written report is a patient care report or PCR. It's also known as a pre-hospital care report. It is a legal document and it records all care from dispatch to hospital arrival. It actually serves six different functions. It serves continuity of care, legal documentation, education, administrative information, essential research, and evaluation and continuous quality improvement. The following information is always included on our PCR and is collected for data. The patient's chief complaint, their level of consciousness or mental status, their vital signs, your initial assessment, and patient demographics such as age, gender, and ethnic background. A lot of administrative information for use in billing, research, and quality improvement can be gathered from the PCR. Examples include time, such as the time the incident was reported, the time EMS was notified or dispatched, the time we arrived on scene, the time they left the scene, the time they arrived at the receiving facility, and the time patient care was transferred. Some of the types of forms we may see include traditional written form with check boxes and a narrative section, a computerized version. The narrative section of the PCR may be the most important, and it includes the timing of events, the assessment findings, the care you provided, the changes in the patient after you provided treatment, the observations at the scene, the final patient disposition, the refusal of care if that was what happened, and who continued care at the hospital. Be sure that you include significant negative findings called pertinent negatives and important observations about the scene. Do not record your conclusions about the incident. Use clear descriptions that do not make any judgments about the patient's condition. Remember I told you before we must be objective. In written documentation, avoid the use of radio codes and use only standard abbreviations. Remember that the report itself is a confidential document and you should be familiar with your state and local laws concerning HIPAA and confidentiality. If you make an error in your reporting, realize everyone does it. We all make mistakes. If you leave something out or record it incorrectly, do not try to hide it. Falsification results in poor patient care. It may result in suspension and or legal action and basically it's a loss of your integrity. Refusals. One of the most issuous areas in EMS. It's a very common source of lawsuits and thorough documentation is crucial. You need to document any assessment findings in any emergency medical care that you provided and have the patient sign the form. Also have a family member, police officer, or bystander sign as a witness if at all possible. Try to keep from using your partner unless you have absolutely no other choice. You still need to complete a PCR for a refusal. It might contain things like complete assessment, evidence that the patient is able to make a rational informed decision, discussion with the patient as to what care or transportation the EMT would like to do, discussion with the patient as to what may happen if they do not allow care or transportation, Discussion with family, friends, or bystanders to try to encourage the patient to allow care. Discussion with medical direction according to your local protocol and providing the patient with other alternatives. For example, going to see his or her family doctor or having a family member drive him or her to the hospital. Also document the willingness of EMS to return, get your signatures, and as I said, always complete a PCR even for refusals. 
Some special reporting situations in EMS depends on your local requirements. Some of these may include gunshot wounds, mandatory in Montana, dog bites, also mandatory in Montana, infectious diseases, which generally go through the hospital, um, suspected physical or sexual abuse only if it involves a child, an adult, or a mentally incapacitated person, and mass casualty incidents. Medical terminology. The reason for using medical terminology is that all medical providers understand it. It is the language of medicine. Medical personnel around the globe speak the same language and it's Latin based. And if you take a course in medical terminology, that can be very helpful. It is required if you would like to get the pre-health certificate here at FVCC for you to also take medical terminology. It is also required as part of our paramedic program. The next section we're going to talk about is communication systems and equipment. We're going to cover base station radios, mobile and portable radios, repeater-based systems, digital equipment, cellular or satellite phones, and other equipment. Base station radios, um, it's any radio hardware containing a transmitter and receiver that is located in a fixed place. It can be a two, it is a two-way radio that does consist of a transmitter and receiver. Mobile and portable radios. A mobile radio is installed in a vehicle. It is used to communicate from the ambulance with the dispatcher and medical control. An ambulance often has more than one mobile radio. Portable radios are handheld devices and they are essential at the scene of an MCI or a mass casualty incident. When we are away from the ambulance, a portable radio is helpful to communicate with dispatch, another unit, or medical control. In Montana and in most places, we work on a repeater-based system. A repeater is a special base station radio that receives messages and signals on one frequency and then automatically retransmits that message that is on them on a second frequency. It provides outstanding EMS communication. Here is an example of a repeater-based system. Messages sent, transmitted, goes through the repeater and then is retransmitted. Voice is not the only EMS communication these days. Some EMS systems can also transmit an ECG or an electrocardiogram from the unit to the hospital. And telemetry allows electronic signals to be converted into coded audible signals. We also use um, paging and tone alerting systems that are digital based. Cellular and satellite phones are essential in today's EMS operations. Often we communicate with hospitals by cellular phone as opposed to radio. They basically are simply lower power, low power portables that we are using. Satellite phones or sat phones are also another option and they can be easily overheard on scanners as one of their downfalls. Always be careful to respect patient privacy and speak in a professional manner whenever you use any form of EMS communications. Ambulances usually have an external public address system as part of their siren. Um, the two-way radio hardware may also operate in simplex or duplex mode. Simplex is push to talk, release to listen. Duplex is simultaneous talk and listen. Med channels are reserved for EMS use. In our county, we use the white channel. That's actually a, hospital, a statewide hospital channel. Trunking, or 800 megahertz systems, use the latest technology to allow greater traffic. Mobile data terminals, or MDTs, are computers inside the ambulance. They receive data directly from dispatch and allow for expanded communications capabilities, for example, mapping programs. The Federal Communications Commission regulates all radio operations in the United States. They have five principal EMS-related responsibilities. They allocate specific radio frequencies for use by providers. They license base stations and assign appropriate radio call signals for those stations. They establish licensing standards and operate specifications for operating specifications for radio equipment used by EMS providers. They establish limitations for transmitter power output and they monitor radio operations. Big Brother is always listening. The FCC's Rules and Regulations section, Part 90, Subpart C, deals with EMS communications issues. When responding to the scene, all EMS systems depend on the skill of your dispatcher. 
The dispatcher receives the first call to 911. They have several important responsibilities. They must properly screen and assign priority to each call according to their predetermined protocols. They select and alert the appropriate EMS response unit. They dispatch and direct EMS response units to the correct location. They coordinate EMS response units with other public safety services until the incident is over and they provide emergency medical instructions to the telephone caller. Dispatchers assign the appropriate EMS response unit based on several criteria. The nature and severity of the problem, the anticipated response time to the scene, the level of training of available EMS response units, the need for additional support, and dispatchers should give the responding units the following nature and severity of illness, injury, or incident, exact location, number of patients involved, and responses by other agencies. They should also give special directions and advisories, such as adverse road or traffic conditions or severe weather reports, time that the units are dispatched. EMTs should report any problems that took place during a run to the dispatcher, and they should inform the dispatcher upon their scene arrival. Um, their arrival report should include any obvious details observed during their scene size up. This is done as a scene size up for most responses. Radio communications must be brief and easy to understand and we use clear text format and not codes. We speak in plain English um, and we, while there are 10 codes that are used, we rarely use them in EMS. In your communications with medical control and hospitals, the principal reason for this is to facilitate communication, communication between you and medical control about your patient. Consulting with medical control serves several purposes. It notifies the hospital of an incoming event or an incoming patient, provides an opportunity to request advice or orders, advises the hospital of special situations. You should plan and organize your radio communication before you transmit. Follow the standard format established by your EMS system. Include seven elements, your unit identification level of service, the receiving hospital and your estimated time of arrival, the patient's age and gender, the patient's chief complaint or your perception of the problem and its severity, a brief history of the patient's current problem, a brief report of physical findings, a brief summary of the care given in any patient response, and you should report all patient information in an objective, accurate, and professional manner. And remember, Scannerland is out there and they may be listening. Medical control is involved in EMS operations. They have a role. They're either offline or indirect or online, which is direct. Depending on how your protocols may be written, you may need to call medical control for direct orders or permission to conduct certain tasks, including administering certain treatments, determining the transport destination of your patients, stopping treatment or not transporting a patient. These are some things we need to talk to them about. In most areas, medical control is provided by the physicians working at the receiving facility. And there are many variations to this that have developed across the country. The link with us and medical control is vital to maintain a high quality of care. You can do this on the radio at the hospital or on a mobile or portable unit when you call. These are ways we can communicate. To call them, there are a number of ways to contact um, them and to control access on ambulance to hospital channels. Dispatcher monitors and assigns appropriate clear medical control channels. That does not happen here. We have a single medical control channel. The physician on the other end bases his or her instructions on the information you are giving him or her. We should never use codes when communicating with medical control unless you are directed to do so by local protocol. Once you receive an order from medical control, repeat it back word for word and then receive confirmation. Do not blindly follow an order that does not make sense to you. It's important that you question those. Regarding special situations, you may initiate communication with hospitals to advise them of an extraordinary call or situation. 
For example, a small rural hospital may be better able to respond to multiple patients of a highway crash if we notify them in advance as we are responding. An entire hospital system needs to be notified of any disaster. Some other special situations we need to notify, hazmat, rescues in progress, multiple casualty incidents, and when notifying, we need to keep several things in mind. The earlier we notify, the better, they are, better able they are to respond. You should provide an estimate of the number of individuals who may need to be transported to the facility and identify any special needs the patient might have, for example, burns, hazmat exposure, and that will help to assist the hospital in preparing. Follow your plan for your system to do this. Maintenance of radio equipment is critical, critical um, in proper operations and use. Like anything else in EMS, it has to be serviced. It is our lifeline. It's our lifeline to other public safety agencies whose duties may include protecting us as well as to medical control. Radios can fail during a run. At the beginning of your shift, you need to um, check your radio equipment. And if it fails, you must have a backup plan. Your backup plan may include standing orders, which are written documents signed by the EMS system's medical director outlining specific directions, permissions, and sometimes prohibitions regarding patient care. And when you properly follow these, they have the same authority and legal status as orders given over the radio. In summary, in the Communications and Documentation chapter, the Shannon Weaver model of communication is a valuable tool in understanding the variables involved in human communications. There are many verbal and nonverbal factors and strategies that are necessary for ther therapeutic communication to occur. Excellent communication skills are crucial in relaying pertinent information to the hospital prior to your arrival. Sick or injured people may not understand what you are doing or saying. Therefore, body language and attitude are very important in gaining the trust of the patient and family. You should take special care with children, elderly patients, and hearing impaired patients, as well as those patients who are visually impaired and non-English speaking patients. EMTs must have excellent person-to-person -person communication skills. You should be able to interact with the patient and any family members, friends, or bystanders. You must complete a patient care report before you leave the hospital. This is a vital part of providing emergency medical care and ensuring continuity of patient care. This information guarantees the proper transfer of responsibility, complies with the requirements of health departments and law enforcement agencies, and fulfills your administrative record keeping needs. Radio and telephone communication links you to the other members of your public safety team, EMS, fire, and law enforcement communities. This enables your entire team to work together effectively. An EMT must understand and be able to use many forms of communication, including mobile and handheld radios. You must know when to use them and what type of information you can transmit. It is your job to know what your communication system can and cannot handle. You must be able to communicate effectively by sending precise, accurate reports on scene regarding patient's condition and treatment you provide. Remember, the lines of communication are not always exclusive. Therefore, you should speak in a professional manner at all times. Reporting and record keeping duties are essential, but they should never come before care of your patients. Thank you.